This is the 122nd Hot Science Cool Talks, and tonight's speaker is Dr. Jose Contreras Vidal. He's an engineer and a neuroscientist. Really, he's a neuroengineer. And he combines this range of expertise to develop ways to help people with disabilities to lead fuller lives. He has positions with the Houston Methodist Research Institute and the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Houston. At the University of Houston, he also directs the Brain Machine Interface Lab. I mean, that sounds like science fiction, but so much cooler because it's real. Jose first got into engineering in middle school when he built an AM radio, and he first got interested in neuroscience when he was in college, and his mother unfortunately had an aneurysm and was not able to communicate for a while. So he became fascinated in trying to understand how the brain works to, to uh, how people communicate. And in addition to all the cool and important stuff that Dr. Contreras Vidal does in his research, he's also a leader in the field that's called neuroaesthetics. This field of study examines what happens in the brain when people experience art and creativity. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing about all of this cool stuff. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Jose Contreras Vidal. Thank you. Very happy to be here. And um, so we're going to talk about uh, brain machine interfaces, but I would like to start with this video clip, which uh, demonstrates some of the robotic technologies out there, and uh, like the robot that you see uh, here on the stage. And these are medical devices that are built to help people uh, with disabilities to, disabilities to walk again. So people with paralysis, for example, with that suffer after a stroke with spinal cord injury, uh, they can use this type of devices to regain uh, mobility and also strengthen their muscles, their, increase their bone density and, and, and other factors. These devices um, can be controlled with joysticks, smartphones, and so some of the more advanced ones have motion sensors that detect tilt of the body as you step forward to, to provide a step. And, and that controls the machine. And what we're doing in my lab is going directly to the brain. So we are listening to the brain through these sensors on the scalp uh, over the head and detecting information about intent. What do you want to do in the next second? Do you want to step forward? Do you want to turn left or right? And we use that information to control these robots. So my talk today will be about this technology, a brain-machine interface, or BMI for short. And I hope that by the end you will understand why we need to work on this technology, uh, who are the, the users of, of this technology, and why it's coming in the future. So with that, um, uh, let's, let's review a, a little bit the outline of my talk. So first, I'm going to tell you why we should spend time working on this technology. How do, do these systems work? How can we train a brain-machine interface to detect intent and to use that to control these robotic systems? I'm going to give you some examples of type of machine that we can control uh, with this technology, and then some novel applications on creativity and aesthetics. And then I'm going to be very happy to answer any questions you may have. So first of all, brain-machine interfaces have multiple names. So in case you hear or read in the news, then you know what we are talking about. So they, they are known as brain-computer interfaces or BCIs, neural interfaces, brain-body interfaces, neural robotics, neural machine interfaces, cybernetics, and the list is growing. Um, but they all mean the same thing, is they connect the brain to an external device or a machine. So it's a direct means of communicate, communication between the brain and the machine. Now, this is so important as uh, this is technology that we hope eventually will uh, reach uh, our end users, our, our people with disabilities, that the Food and Drug Administration, which is uh, the regulatory agency that, uh, that uh, approves these devices, has a definition for a brain-machine interface. It's basically a neuroprosthesis that interface with the central, that means the brain, or the peripheral nervous system, that means maybe the muscles on our legs or the spinal cord to restore lost motor or sensory capabilities. That means you cannot move or feel, you know, by using this technology, you can regain or retrain the brain to, to feel 
and, and work again. Now, these systems come in different forms. There are systems that are non-invasive, like the one that we're going to demonstrate today, where we listen to the brain from the outside. So there is no need for an electrode to be inserted inside your brain. So that's a non-invasive system. We have also invasive systems that uh, go inside the brain or in the surface of the brain, which requires surgery. So there's a little bit of risk involved on that. That's an invasive system. Um, uh, they can be placed on the brain, so that's a cortical system, or in the periphery, for example, on, 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 over uh, the muscles or the spinal cord. And they can be also invasive and non-invasive. So we can put sensors over the belly of the muscle to detect the electromyographic or EMG activity generated by the muscle, or we can use a penetrating electrode inside uh, um, uh, of uh, the muscle. So with those definitions, um, then we can uh, ask the question, why should we develop this technology in the first place? And why we create this technology? So we have several goals. One is we want to improve the quality of life and the independence of people with disabilities, people that could not walk, for example, that have suffered limb loss, or that have a stroke and, and they have difficulties in uh, doing, you know, performing activities of daily living. Um, so we want to help those people. Second, we want also to understand how the brain works in both health and disease. Say uh, after Parkinson's disease or spinal cord injury or stroke, we would like to know what has changed in the brain, how the brain works, so that we can then devise new technologies to help restore function. And the other is, well, we want to promote and enhance human-machine interaction. And a brain-machine interface is an example of that as well. So we want to design ways to communicate directly between the brain and the machine. Think about, you know, thinking about your mom and automatically having your cell phone calling your mom. You know, that would be the ultimate uh, interface. So you don't need to enter uh, 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 things on your phone. You just think about it, and then you can call your mom. So that's a direct communication. Now, consider that just in the U.S. alone, there are about 6 million people with paralysis. 6 million. Now, we think about limb loss, it's about 2 million and increasing. We're becoming older. We're becoming, you know, um, subjected to chronic disease and, and disability. So we really need to do something so that, that when we are there, we have technology to help restore function. Um, and the loss of independence is very critical. We want accessibility. We want to be able to work, to go back to our office, to play, um, to, to, to be at home. So um, this is very important. Now, the lack of mobility uh, brings other challenges secondary disabilities that affect our quality of life, independence, well-being. One is spasticity. So certain muscles become contracted, very hard to relax. Contractures, muscles lose their flexibility. They become very stiff. All of these affect mobility, of course. They are urinary tract infections. Very often people with, uh, uh, they are on a wheelchair, you know, they, they have to go to a doctor to, to take care of, of these infections. Impaired bowel movements. We don't even think about it, but this is very important. And people are affected because of the lack of mobility. There's also a, you know, cardiovascular problems that, that are generated, skin conditions, pressure sores, and the list goes on and on. But all of these compromises your quality of life. And some of these are even more important for some people than walking. So the mobility and these complications, physiological complications, are very serious. They are very challenging to, to address. So we hope with, with this technology, we can uh, restore the balance in the system and restore mobility and independence. Now, how do these systems work? Well, consider that we have uh, this robotic system that are fully instrumented. They have many sensors. If we move, the, the, the system knows how we, how we move. Um, and some of them have force sensors, uh, also pressure sensors on, so that uh, it, they, they know the pressure we're putting on the floor. And if, we, if you're wearing the sensor on the head, the brain cap, then we also have information about the brain. So really, we have, um, we have multiple signals that are coming from the technology. At, at the level of the brain, we get brain signals. 
you know, brain waves. Then uh, from, from the robotics, we can get information about the movement. We call it kinematics. And also information from the muscles that uh, rotate our, 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 our legs. You know, that's uh, EMG electromyography. And some other signals that can be captured together. So we have a lot of information about how the body and the brain function at any given time. So we can use that for diagnosis. So the, the physician can, can know what's your current state and what we can do to restore uh, a normal state. And it can also uh, be used to develop these brain-machine interfaces that can be used to control these robotic devices. And of course, whenever we act on the environment, we interact with people, with machines, there's always feedback. And that feedback is used by the brain for learning. And so this is simply a tool, and by play interacting with this tool, the brain can learn to operate the machine better and better over time. These systems have multiple functions. I alluded already to the fact that they are full of sensors, so they can have diagnostic functions. So it can tell us about the type of movement, the extent, the speed, and the amount of body movement. And that's very important. If you have Parkinson's disease, there's poverty of movement. You have very you, you, it's very challenging for you to move, to, to walk, to do things. Uh, the technology will tell us to what extent that's happening. And how that affected by medication, by uh, other factors. But this system can be used for rehabilitation. The ultimate goal is to use the technology to retrain your body and your brain so you can restore the function. So that you can use this system just temporarily. That after training, you will not need this longer because your brain has learned again to control your body. And the other is the assistance. You know, so initially, uh, after paralysis, you cannot really function. Uh, you don't feel or can control your legs. And you need full assistance so the system to be able to carry you, you know, as your brain and your body starts to relearn the function. So the system really have multi multiple functions. And, and, and that's really an advantage for the physician and for, uh, for, uh, for the end user. Now, how do the systems work? Well, I already told you that uh, um, we work with non-invasive systems. That's an example on, 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 on the figure. So we use these sensors, uh, uh, the brain cap, that we normally use 64 sensors that are distributed across the whole head. So we have some sensors that look at visual cortex, so we know about the information that you are processing, uh, the visual processing in your brain. Some are over sensory motor areas that tell you how you move and how you uh, receive feedback from your muscles and, and, and your legs, your arm. And, and some are over auditory cortex, you know, that process sound and so on and so forth. So we really get a full picture of what's going on inside your brain. I like to call it the information about the, the neural symphony of the brain. Because really it's a concert, concerted information. Different brain areas are talking to each other in, 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 a, in a regular manner to produce behavior. And so it's non-invasive, it's whole head, so we can look at the whole, listen to the whole symphony of neural activity, and, and, and then look for information that is relevant. Intent, emotion, stress, fatigue. All these things can be extracted from the brain activity. Now, there are all the types of, of BMIs. Uh, I mentioned uh, invasive ones that require penetrating electrodes going inside your brain. And this is an example of a uh, microelectro array with about 100 sensors that are inserted over sensory motor cortex in the brain. So that requires opening your, your, your skull and you know, inserting electrodes and all that, right? So, so there's subject involved. Um, it is invasive. Um, it, it's more accurate than the EEG, the non-invasive, because you can target specific brain areas with high resolution, but you have limited access to a few areas. Right now, it's not possible to, uh, look, to penetrate the whole brain, right? So you have to, to be selective on the areas that, 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 that you can do. And, and also, there are some questions about the reaction of the uh, biological tissue to the electrode, you know, the uh, biocompatibility, and, and also the, whether this is long lasting. You know, right now, to the best of my knowledge, um, the longest implant has been going for seven years, right? But we, hopefully, we live more than seven years. We, we want a solution that is lifelong, right? Um, so this is an example 
of brain waves that we can record with the EEG. Um, so uh, the top panel um, is, is, is just the raw signal and very noisy, and you can see the units here. This is about a quarter of, 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 of a second here. This is 30 microvolts. So these are very tiny, 10 to the minus six, right? Very tiny signals uh, that, that we need to, to, to capture. And there are some brain waves uh, that are very slow, like delta, not really slow, and then some that are really fast, like gamma, right? And, and in between. I, you know, I like to think these at different stages of your brain. So when you, if you're still using a radio in your car, you know, you need to tune, tune up the radio to get to a specific station to listen to music or to the news, right? And you have to go through the tuner to get to the right, the right place. You, you can look in that way to this, right? So some information might be in the delta band, so you need to tune your BMI, your brain machine interface, to listen to the delta but not to the gamma, right? So um, uh, it's a matter of how the information is uh, represented in the brain and where and how, right? So um, I want to give you a demonstration of this. I'm going to ask my, my students, uh, um, David, Jesus, and Kevin to come to the stage. And David is already wearing one of these caps, e.g. brain caps. He has 64 channels. Uh, it's a wireless system, and he's listening to to his brain, and he's gonna be, um, um, so we have fitted the robot to his height, and he's gonna be inside the robot. I'm gonna secure himself, and I'm gonna be displaying the, uh, the brain waves. These are the brain waves, right? Um, so this is time. Right, so the, 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 the brain is highly dynamic, it's changing always, even when you're asleep. And, and so it's, this is time. And each line here, each, each time series, represents one of these sensors, right? Uh, from the front of the head to the back. So these here are sensors over visual areas of cortex, right? So I'm gonna ask David to close his eyes when you close your eyes, there is no visual input, right? There is no visual processing. But visual cortex is still working. You see these, these waves here. See, these are alpha waves between 8 and 12 times per second. Um, when there is no visual input, the brain um, it starts to oscillate very regularly. It's idling. It's just waiting for something to happen. And you see these nice waves. Could you open your eyes? When he opens your, his eyes, the information, the visual information starts to get into visual cortex, and now this brain waves go, go away, right? So when you open your eyes, you are processing, you know, uh, many things. You're processing color, shape, you know, texture, and all that. So visual cortex is really busy. And, and, and that has the outcome of removing these oscillations which are doing nothing. They're just idling, very smooth. There's no information contained on that. And, and this type of modulation of the brain wave is what we use to decode what's going on, right? So um, these, these areas here are related to sensory motor cortices. You know, so the areas of the brain that are about movement and the, the feeling from, from, from movement. And, and so when we want to decode the intent from movement, those areas are part part of, of the model, right? Because they contain that information. But what we have learned over time is that no matter what you do, even the simplest thing like moving your finger recruits many areas of the brain. Because we need to plan, we need to locate the target, decide about which finger, the speed, the size. So there are so many things that our brain needs to consider that we are not even aware. It's, it's un un unconscious. That, that when we, do, we see the movement, it's just the tip of the iceberg. It's just a tiny thing of what's going on inside your brain. So I'm um, going to ask Kevin to, so we're gonna, um, uh, in, in, uh, when we develop brain machine interfaces, we need to understand how brain activity relates to movement. So what we do is we calibrate the brain, brain machine interface by controlling the robot's movement while asking our participant to think and feel the effort of movement, in this case, walking and stopping. So we're gonna try that. You wanna hear a beep 
and then you're going to see an instruction there, and that's what's going to happen. So he's actually thinking about stopping. Walking. We, 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 don't, we don't think about walking. It, it just happens. It's very automatic. We, we, we don't think about stopping, um, but this effort. Uh, but it's mostly it's, uh, unconscious effort. So the computer communicates with the robot uh, through a wireless link, and we're having some, some real-time issues here. How about if uh, you restart the system and we can come back, okay? Let, let's do that. We will come back to this, try to figure out, do some reverse engineering of the problem and see what, what's going on. But I wanted to show you the, way, the brain waves because that's what we're talking about here. So, so let me tell you how this works, all right? So I told you about the recording electrodes. So there's, a, there's a, a, the neural interface, uh, which is the sensor that's listening to the brain. And that information is sent to the computer uh, uh, to build a decoder. The decoder translates the brain activity into a motor command that then can control a robot, for example. So in this case, the, the brain activity is controlling this artificial hand so that the, uh, per the, the person with the hand amputation can, can regain control of the hand for grasping. Now, when you perform a, mo a movement like grasping this bottle, uh, that causes feedback signals to, to, to emerge, right? Whether, you no, know, there are errors maybe because the class wasn't perfect, um, or maybe it was perfect, you get rewarded. You, you feel good because you, you, ever, you were su successful in, in getting that information. And in any case, that, that feedback goes back to your brain and to close the loop, right? So wh whatever you do through the brain machine interface and the movement that is triggered uh, with the robot, uh, it generates feedback that goes back to the brain and it, it, it gets integrated with the next uh, command. So uh, this is uh, you know, basically how the system works. And you can see here that um, you know, this is uh, a, a picture of, of, of the brain and um, th there are many blobs of activity happening and, and these are electrical signals that propagate through the, the volume, the tissue, and, and they're, captured, they're captured here through the sensor. So there are many layers that this signal need to to cross to get to the surface of the scar where we can record them with EEG. Now, as the signal travels through these layers, it gets degraded, it gets very noisy, distorted. So it's a very challenging problem. And, and so we, we need to use different you know, machine learning tools and, and other uh, uh, possibilities to, to achieve this. So, so let, let me give you some examples of robots that, 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 that can um, be controlled with, uh, with brain activity. Um, so these are some examples. System that we have developed at the University of Houston uh, based on EEG, which is non-invasive. Uh, this is an example from Brown University. It's a person with um, a tetraplegia. He has an implanted electro over uh, bottle cortex, and that's used to detect intent to control this posterior limb, right, through the implanted electro, right? So that's really amazing. Um, this is a posterior limb that can be controlled with a peripheral neural interface, so from muscle activity uh, in the remaining uh, muscles of, of the limb. Uh, and this one is also another version of peripheral uh, brain-computer interface where uh, muscles uh, that remain, for example, the pectoralis here, uh, can be uh, used to control this, this limb, right? So these prosthetic limbs are for people with amput amputations or with uh, you know, paralysis. Now, this is the only question I'm going to present today, okay? So uh, uh, bear with me. So this is uh, a, an example of a decoder that is used by a brain-machine interface. So uh, 
as an example, I'm going to use grasping because that's a, really a very important activity of daily living, right? Grasping a bottle, for example, right? So we have found through many analyses and others that, that you can decompose grasping into three uh, components, right? The first one is the grasp opening and closing. That means opening and closing your fingers, right? That's the first component. Um, the second one is uh, the hand spreading, like this. For example, you, you are going to grasp a big object, and you need to spread your hand to be able to grab the object. And, and the last one is the, the thumb rotation. That provides opposition space for the grasp to happen, right? You, you, you need to close on the object. So these three components, um, that you, you can uh, call them also synergies, or in this case, we call them PCs, principal components, are very important for characterizing grasping, different types of grasping. And so what we do is we train the brain-machine interface to predict these components. So this component one to three is PCI. Then uh, we have this a double summation, right? Um, so EEG is the EEG brainwave at sensor end at time t. So this, this is the, the actual measurement of EEG and sensor end. But we also look at the past. So this index k tells you how far in the past we need to look to predict the future. And, and then um, uh, we need to train the computer to, uh, to find the value for these coefficient betas here. And this is basically telling us, you know, given that we have 64 channels and we have, say, 10 delays, you know, we look from the current time to 100 milliseconds in the past, you know, every 10 milliseconds. So, you know, how, how we integrate across the space and time the value of these sensors so that we can predict uh, uh, this component of grasp, right? And so you, you, you use some, some algorithms to, to find these, these coefficients so that you can maximize the prediction given the EEG that you are recording. So that's, that's one of the type, type of equation. It's a linear equation. It's very simple. I'm actually very amazed that we can do this. And I'm gonna give you the, I'm gonna tell you the, the trick why this is possible in, in a minute. But um, I, want, I, I just want to summarize the, the recipe, okay? So first, uh, we want to detect intent. So that's, that's the goal, because if we detect intent, we can control a device using that signal. Now, this can be extracted from the fluctuations in the amplitude, okay, of these slow brain waves in the delta band. So the delta band are the very slow waves that you saw before, right? And so we found out that the intent is encoded in the amplitude, how this amplitude changes over time and space. The other thing is that we need to record delta waves not only from one sensor or two or 10. We need to record from the whole head because the information is in a network. The information that we capture on the outside of the head is noisy and very tiny, 10 to the minus six very tiny signals. They are highly contaminated by many artifacts. And, and so, but when we look, when we listen to the whole head, we get no information to be able to separate the signal from the noise, right? And the third is we need to train computers to find these patterns that are associated with the intent. So that's the equation I told you before. So we, we need to find the coefficients that tell us how should we um, uh, weight the value of each sensor at uh, any given time and, and space, right? This is an example of the prediction from the model, right? So these are five different types of grasping actions that we ask our participants to work on, right? And these are the three components, opening, closing of the fingers, finger spray, and thumb rotation. If we look at the can, you know, the Coke, uh, a can of uh, a soft drink, right? So uh, this is the amplitude of that component. So the, how we move the fingers as we go for, for the grasping of the can. Uh, and, and, and so when we combine this uh, in, at the uh, prosthetic hand, we can mimic the, the human-like movement you know, of grasping. And as we can do this for different objects. So this is an example of that. This is happening in real time. The participant can see the object. He knows where it's located, what is the orientation, what is the size, um, you know, can estimate the weight. So he can plan. His brain can see these attributes of the object, they can plan for the grasp. But his brain is disconnected because he doesn't have a hand. 
So using this model that I showed you before, and this data wave information, we extract the information about the object, and we use that to control the, the prosthetic hand in real time, right? So this is a lateral pinch, right? Very different than a whole hand prosthetic. And this is, can be done just from the outside. We know other ways. So, um, and, and this can, um, uh, we test uh, our participants participant over weeks um, uh, to make sure that they, they, they can continue to do so. So this is an example of, of a neuroprosthetic hand. Now, this is how it, uh, what happens in this particular model, right? So uh, we have, um, in the horizontal axis, we have time. So zero is the current time. So we are recording time t. But then the model also uses past information up to 100 milliseconds in the past, right? So this is a scale map. That's the back. This is your left ear. This is your right ear. So you can look from the top, right? Each dot represents one sensor. There are 64. And the color scale is telling us about how important is that sensor to the prediction of the grasp, right? So, the, so that means that these particular, these, these sensors here are really important. They, they, they contribute uh, uh, quite a lot to the prediction, right? Also here. So what you see here is that um, during this time, the brain is planning your grasp. Right, it's looking at the object attributes and the location, all that. And then time zero is when the grass actually starts. And what you can see is that um, uh, this particular skull maps or brain maps, uh, they are a series of blobs that are really relevant. This is a network, right? So that means that we need all these sensors to make a good prediction. And this particular prediction at times uh, 80 milliseconds in the past account for 16% of the prediction. If we look at, at this other one here, this accounts for 17%. So, you know, these two at 80 and 90 milliseconds in the past account for most of the information prior to the grasp, right? So that means that 80 milliseconds before you actually perform the movement, the brain already knows what's gonna happen. And we can use that information to control the prosthetic hand, right? So this is amazing, right? Uh, it's telling you how the signal propagates across time and the space. Now, let's go now to the lower limb. No, we're talking about walking, as very important uh, activity. So these are some of the, the robots that we have worked with, that we have in the lab. You're most welcome to, to visit us at University of Houston. And the idea is we have a person with paralysis, for example, after a spinal cord injury, or we have a, a person, a, a veteran that has lost the limbs, the lower limbs, right? Uh, the legs, so we need a prosthetic device here, or we need an exoskeleton like this one so that we can regain walking. And we are recording from the brain, right? It goes to the brain machine interface, you know, extract the features that are relevant for walking, to predict walking, and that produces some outputs that can be used to control these prosthetic or exoskeletons, right? Now, you can do this in different ways, right? So one possible way is to decode the intent of walking, and then let the robot implement that, right? So you pre-program the robot to a step, always the same way, but only when you want to do it, right? Or you control the robot to a stop. So you think about stopping and the robot will stop, will freeze, right? So that's a very high level decoding, right? It could be turn right or turn left, right? Or sit down or stand up. So this is a very high order. But you could also think about decoding at the low level how you move the legs in the space time. So maybe you, you want a robot not only for mobility, but you want really to be squeezing the form you move, you know, like ballet or you know, you're dancing, right? So it's very important how you coordinate your, your limbs. In that case, you're not just interested with moving, but you're interested in moving in some particular way. And so we can think about decoding the joint trajectories, you know, how we move each joint of our body in space and time, or we're just, hey, you know, I'm gonna take it easy, I just want to walk and, implement, and the robot will do it for me, right? So there are different ways to do this. Um, when we're working on developing a neuroprosthetic for, for amputees, there were a lot of instrumentation. You know, so we had the brain cap here that, that, that David is also using. 
they have also some sensors on their uh, arms and legs uh, that tell you how they move in the space time. And, and even, even on the prosthetic leg, right? So we know at uh, any given time how the body and the brain are working. And we can map one onto the other, right? So in order to develop the brain machine interface, we need to know, you know, what pattern of brain activity relate to what movement. And if we record the patterns of muscle, muscular activity, so we're not talking about brain, but we're talking about muscle in the remaining, remaining um, uh, uh, muscle uh, after amputation and during different tasks. So this is, you know, walking over the ground, ramping, uh, and, you know, different types of walking. We see that there's a pattern. So we can uh, recognize the pattern and then predict what kind of action uh, you want to do. So the muscle activity can also be used to detect the intent during walking. Um, it has, uh, it's very selective because it is related to a specific muscle. Um, so we can localize well the signal. And it's very effective for controlling, you know, prosthetic legs uh, uh, during locomotion. But it has a limited uh, global uh, context. So it doesn't know about what the other muscles are doing or what the other leg is doing. So there are some limitations to what you can do. So this lack of global information, global state about the body with a peripheral interface. So this, this diagram tells you that, right? So we have the EMG or myoelectric sensor that measures the brain activity, the, the, the muscular activity, uh, or EMG. And so you can recognize these patterns really well and understand how they should be combined uh, in a neural machine interface to control the prosthetic leg, right? And then as you move, you get feedback. And so that closes the loop. And there are, there, there are you know, myoelectric prosthesis out there. So this is how they work, by rec recognizing this pattern of activity. Now, um, if we want to add this global information, then we add the EEG, right? Now we combine the two the, of best words. We have global information from EEG that knows about the whole body, including the environment, because we have access to the sensory information, with highly localized information at the level of the muscle with the myoelectric, right? So we can combine these two to improve our, our detection of user intent and, and deal with changing environments, right? Um, so just to summarize, right? So with this, we have a signal quality. It's, it's a little bit less than this. You can, you, can, uh, you know, uh, find, a, you know, visually at least here, uh, a, a very distinctive pattern. But it's very hard to do it with EEG. You know, you have to process the signal a lot. With this, you have full coverage. With this, it's very localized, right? So when you integrate the advantage, advantage of both domains, then you can get better interfaces, right? And so um, this is part of, of the work that my lab and others are doing, right? So uh, that's going into the future of, of this technology. So let me give you another example. In this case, uh, we have the brain cap and the brain machine interface detecting particular states, you know, uh, that the uh, user wants to do. You know, standing up, um, walking, or you know, sitting, uh, or transition from sitting to standing, and so on and so forth. So these, these states um, we can recognize with EEG through the BMI. And then some of these states we can pre-program on the robot, right? So if we know that you want to walk, then we instruct the, 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 the robot to to switch between a stance and swing phases, right? So that we implement the walking, right? So this is a nice collaboration between the brain of the robot and the, and the human brain, acting together in collaboration. It's called shared control, right? And, and it's a good way to, to do the design. So I'm gonna give you an example of that here. This is a person with paralysis, so he cannot feel or move the legs you know, from the waist down um, is, is um, this paralysis. So he's thinking about walking and robots walking for him. Um, he can talk and stop and, and, and you know, and, and continue. And, you know, um, this particular uh, participant told me that after being on, on this machine for a couple of hours, he had better bowel movement at night, for example. He was feeling better just because he was um, you're moving around, shifting load, and, and, and just you know, regaining some of the functions, some of the benefits of mobility that, that we have. Now, if you look at the brain of a person that is able, 
and the brain of somebody that had a spinal cord injury. So when you have spinal cord injury, there is no feedback signals going back to the brain. There is no the commands going from the brain to, um, to the legs. Um, and you do that over a period of time. So there are here nine sessions over a period of, of a month. So the particular uh, participant tried this nine times. What you see in session one, and, and again, this represents the, the contribution of each brain area to the decoding of walking, right? Just as, as we did with grasping. So uh, you can see that it took about uh, five sessions you know, with the system to be able to have a, you know, a good grasping of what he needed to do to control the machine, right? So by session five, the representation for walking um, uh, became steady, right? Was very consistent. And, and, and this part of the brain um, is associated neurophysiologically with the representation for walking for the legs, right? So initially, the, the volunteer was um, um, uh, affected by the limitation of the robot, because the robot has only six degrees of freedom, so two at the hip, two at the knees, and two at the ankles. We have more. We, we, more, we move more naturally. This robot just moves like this. So when you try to be on one of these systems, you fight it, right? You, you, you want to walk your way, but you cannot. And so it took, it took five sessions for an able-bodied person to, to understand that and then be able to control, right? Now, if we look at the survivor, you know, the spinal cord injury survivor, we see something similar. But um, first of all, this representation is not the same, right? So there was a reorganization in the brain, we think, right? Now, uh, the, the, this uh, participant was able to control the machine, but in a different manner because it had a lesion in the brain. Because even though he was paralyzed because of spinal cord injury, the, his brain didn't receive the feedback from the legs that we normally receive. That led to changes in these cortical areas related to walking, and, and so we have a different pattern. And, but if you look at the performance, so this is how well they perform. You know, they were learning. They were getting better and better. So this is 95% accuracy, right? So both the survivor here and, and the able body were able to learn to control the machine, but they use slightly different ways to do it. This is a, a patient with a stroke. You can see that uh, this part of the body is affected. You know, he cannot really grasp compared with the other hands or, or he's affected on, on, on one side of the body. But with this robot, he can normalize the coordination of the legs. and uh, It looks more natural. By the end of the training, he didn't need to use the walker. He was able to walk with the robot but without the walker. So he regained some independence. So that's another example of a machine that you can control with brain activity. This is also, um, a, this is for a VR, not for an avatar application. So this is the original data from the person with a stroke. And, and these are reconstructions or predictions from the brain machine interface using two different models, right? So we can use this signal not only to control a robot like this, but we can control a, a, a VR environment. You know, we, we can have a virtual leg for training and rehabilitation. Um, but the ultimate goal here is, you know, we should do something for our children with disabilities. You know, most of the technology has been developed with, for adults. But kids, they have different needs. Their body is growing. Their brain is changing. They're going through development. Both the brain and the body are really highly plastic. Those are the best candidates for the technology because their brain and the body can adapt you know, uh, more easily to the requirements of the technology and coexist. So we have developed a, 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 what I think is the first pediatric exoskeleton in my lab for children with cerebral palsy or spinal bifida or spinal cord injury and, and other disabilities. And we are also developing a brain machine interface so that they can use it. And, and promote plasticity and regain function. So we're, we're very, very excited about this. Um, so um, can we try again? So let's try if it works this time before we go to the, to the new applications.
So again, we have a 64 uh, channel uh, EEG cap. Uh, this is represented here. Uh, uh, David, um, could you close your eyes and rest? So you can see the brain waves, right? Open your eyes, blink three times. One, two, three. Clench your teeth. Right, so everything we do generates an electrical potential that we can capture. And together with that, of course we have his thought, right? His needs, you know, uh, uh, you know maybe he's under stress here because in front of you, right? And he, you know, all the light illumination, I mean, this first time we do it here on stage. So this is, this is a, first, a first for us, right? But, but let's, let's, let's have mental power here all, try to help David <laughs> operate it. So let's try. Does it stop? <laughs> well, thank you, David. <laughs> I think he owns a, 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 an A, right? So, I mean, uh, so. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, one of the challenges with these systems is that context is very important. So this is the first time we do it here with this, right? We do it at the hospital, we do it in the, you know, in, in, in some other places, outdoors. But context is very important, so when you train a model, if you don't capture the content, then it's gonna be harder for the brain machine to recognize the pattern of activity because this new noise, this, this new stuff, right? And that's one of the challenges with technology. So we are, we are now working to, um, to collect big data. So that means, you know, tens of thousands of brain scans using EEG so that we can really understand uh, context and how context affects brain activity. And that leads to, to my, my uh, final um, part of the talk, which is uh, novel applications. So this is a video that I'm going to show.
we also doing this with children at the Children's Museum and other places. It's very important to, uh, to understand the creative process of children. And, and I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts, right? So why shifting from controlling machines to studying the arts? Well, one is because when we move, it's not only about mobility, it's about communicating. You know, when we're talking, having a social interaction, we speak through our body, right? And that's affected, for example, in Parkinson's disease. You know, they lose this capability to, you know, to, to communicate through the way they move. And, um, you know, people with autism, perhaps. And, you know, there, there are different disabilities where by integrating the emotional, the, the, um, the communication and, and, the, and the mobility, we can uh, get better intervention. So, so it's about movement and communication. Uh, and the other thing is that, you know, the, our brand has been designed in a way that we all are creative in some sense, right? Because when, when you are looking at the surroundings, you know, our sensory areas are capturing the information through different sensors we have and decomposing that into patches of colors, lines, corners, frequencies, and you know, all these things. But then the signals are going to the front of our brain where we put them back together to get our vision of the world. And there is when our memories get into the mix, when our context gets into the mix. And, and so in a way, you know, the way we see the world is our own creation. And, and, and so we are studying aesthetics, you know, going to museums to, to understand how your brain responds to that because we want to understand what's unique about your brain. So um, I think that we have spent a lot of time in neuroscience uh, focusing on group data, on this group of people behave this way, or that group is different because, you know, there's a disease or something. I think we need now to focus on why we are so unique, why, what, what's the difference? Because at the end of the day, in medicine, in education and learning, the only way we're going to succeed is we understand exactly what are your needs and your capabilities. So it's why we are now working with, with artists and children and the general public to, to collect data. You know, we have tested about 3,000 people so far. Um, it, it's a pleasure to go to our public, right, and they having, having them come to the lab. Um, but this is, um, you know, this is a, a, an effort that's going to take some time before we can um, have enough data points to do to, to that. So just to uh, uh, summarize the approach we use in my lab, uh, I call it convergent, art, science, and, and engineering. And basically, so we focus on neuroscience, engineering, and now the arts. And when we combine neuroscience and engineering, we have neuroengineering, brain-computer interfaces, where we look at intentionality, right? And then when you look at neuroscience and art, it's neuroaesthetics. And then we're interested in judgment, preference, emotion, right? When we look at art and engineering, then we have artistic brain-computer interfaces, you know, brain-computer interaction, artificial intelligence, you know, you know, when we create a piece of art, you know, how we do it, you know. Again, the focus is understanding the individual brain and, and how the variation in, in, in the activity. The applications are immense. So from our engineering, you know, we are working with artists developing new interactive uh, installations. Um, art therapy is very important. Uh, it's non-invasive. It's, it's great. It's, it's, it's very cheap. Uh, we should do more art. And in terms of art and neuroscience, art education, informal learning, museums, events like this, right, informal learning happens. In terms of engineering, and uh, uh, you know, we are focused on developing uh, medical devices that, that are effective and safe. And from the point of view of neuroscience, we're trying to understand how the brain works. We call it reverse engineering the brain. And so, you know, this is really uh, a very challenging, but really very interesting approach that, 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 that we use in the lab. And, and my students come from different areas, you know, not only engineering, but, you know, um, the arts, the, you know, architecture and design, um, human performance, and so on and so forth. So um, with that, I think we have time for, for questions and answers. Thank you for your attention. We have our first question. Would it be possible to insert technology into a person to control all their vital functions and dramatically increase their lifespan? 
Wow. Well, that's a yeah. That's a very interesting question. I mean, um, there's a lot of research that that has been happening in terms of you know the brain or the periphery controlling machines, and now there is research that focuses on our internal organs, right? Um, and, and, and so I, I think it's, 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 uh, it's happening. Um, I think we're just starting to, to work on that. But uh, through, you know, the idea is to use neuromodulation, right? Say uh, this is an organ that is not working properly, and, and you know that, and you can do stimulation, for example, to, to, um, to make it work again uh, uh, in a more normal way. Um, so that, that, that's, that's possible, yeah. Okay. This question comes from Anonymous. Are there military applications for this technology? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so in fact, the, um, uh, there were two prosthetic limbs, the, uh, the modular prosthetic limb and the deck arm that were funded by the military, um, and they're used by veterans. Uh, so they're, they're really good applications, right, medical applications. Um, but also, you can think about augmentation, right? When you need to use it, when you want to use the robotics not only to to restore function but to go beyond function, right? And that's where you know there are issues with ethics and you know, aspects, right? So um, th 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 there's a need for a conversation on this, right? Uh, we need to be responsible how we use technology, how do we develop technology, um, and technology um, is not for everyone, and but also not everybody. Um, can use the technology because there are some inclusion and exclusion criteria, right? So um, in, in my view, we need to provide options so that you, the end user, can decide what's best for you. Because my preference is going to be different than yours. You know, if, I'm, if, if, I, if I have par paralysis, maybe for me, walking is the most important thing, but maybe for you will be, you know, I, I want to get rid of pressure source, right? That's important for me, right? So it, 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 it changes, you know? So we need to take into account um, the, the end user early on in the design. So we, we don't need to design and then see if we can find somebody that will use it. We, we need to work with them from the beginning. Great. And this question comes from Little Robot. Can the children learn to jump again? Can the children learn? To jump again. You know that, um, so we, we have been interviewing meeting with children that, uh, as we uh, work on the first uh, clinical trial for the pediatric exoskeleton, um, and, and one of the children, uh, we, we asked the question, you know, what, why would you like to walk again? And he said, because I want to dance. Mm. Uh, because he's been uh, watching movies and he really loves to dance. We would like to tap dance. And so, the, the, it's possible. It's, it's, you know, this technology is not yet there for jumping, but, um, it, 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 I think in, in some years that would be possible, yeah. Great. Another question from Anonymous. Could this work on animals? Some experiments are being done in animals. In fact, some of the very early experiments on brain machine interfaces were done in monkeys and cats. So they have a brain. The, the, the brain is very, you know, in some ways it's very similar. So yeah, this, this can work for, for animals too. So we can have prosthetic legs for for dogs or, you know, there is no reason no why to use that in animals, right? I mean, it's, um, I think it's fine. This question comes from someone calling themselves a runaway brain. <laughs> can, can we make the same robots for animals and have them control a machine with their brain? I propose a rat with spider machine legs. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean yeah, as I said, uh, you know, they, they are, there are stories out there already, you know, that involve uh, you know, rats, uh, cats, or, or monkeys. Um, and, and these are done uh, to, uh, you know, to, to study the system. You know, there, there are many risks. So, you know, before we consider going to, to humans, right, we need to do our homework and understand what can go wrong and, and understand how the brain works and all that, right? So. This question from MTG. I have an aunt who has been paralyzed for 70 years. Would her brain still have the pathways needed for this? Yeah, we have found that. Uh, so, you know, when, uh, so it takes time to learn to walk, you know, as a baby, you know. Uh, you know we're very happy the first time that, that, that we see our kids standing up on first step. 
Um, but walking, uh, how the brain represents walking is an interplay of different type of signals, right? It's not only uh, the motor signals that control our legs, but it's hearing walking, right? The stepping, right? It's looking at walking, you know? We can recognize our friends by the way they walk, right? When we hear the sounds of somebody walking, we, oh, somebody's walking, right? So this representation comes from different places. So even though you have not walked for seven years, you're still listening to walk and you're still watching people walk. And I think those signals are helping to maintain that representation. So the amputee, uh, our, our volunteer with the, the hand amputation, he, he, he lost his hand when he was maybe five, you know, and it has been years. And we were able to tap on that representation because I think our, our, these representations are very rich. Mm -hmm. And so we can refresh them. Nice. Great. This question comes from someone who asks questions at every one of these. Uh, you might remember the name, Quilly Nelson the Hedgehog. And so Quilly's question is, what are the possible unintended consequences of mind-controlled robots? I mean, that was a question about military application, so you know, that could be, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's an important question. Uh, again, it's, it's about the, the ethical use of the technology, right? Um, and um, so there, there are working groups now. Um, NIH, National Institute of Health, very interested in this topic, and you know, they, they, you know, they, they are funding people uh, to look at the ethics. Um, IEEE, uh, Association of Engineers, they, they, they have working groups that, that work uh, to understand, you know, what is the, 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 the appropriate use of the technology, you know, when, when, when we say no, right? When, you know, how, how we deal with this situation. Yeah. Great. This question comes from Math Wizard. What education would you recommend to a future scientist in this field? Um, well, it's, you know, I, people ask me, you know, how do you recruit the students? Well, they, they have to be motivated and committed, right? If you have the, the, uh, the commitment and, and the motivation, you, you're going to learn. And working on this, you need people that are experts on, you know, on movement analysis, on programming, you know, software engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, you know, computer science, you know. I mean, we are learning from our colleagues from dance because they are you know, a highly skilled way of controlling their body, right? So I would say um, it helps to start with math because it's a lot easier than learning later on. But really, uh, there is always a, a, a place for you. Even if this marketing, right? I, I had a student um, that, that was double major in dance and marketing. Um, she learned to program in MATLAB, you know, scientific programming language, and, and she was running my lab, you know, helping me run the lab, because she was really good at communication, and that's very important. So, um, so I opened my lab to, to whatever background you have, as long as you are committed and you are motivated. Raise your hand if you qualify. <laughs> You have a lot of future graduate students out there. Um, yep, let's make this the last question, but it's a second question from the Olmsteads. Would it be possible to have a body that is completely robotic, but with just a human brain to control it? Right. Um. <laughs> We, we are, you know, we have prosthetic legs, prosthetic hands, prosthetic arms. You know, it's a, just a matter of putting them together, right? Um, you know, I think, you know, uh, technically it might be possible to build a whole body, right? And if we can sort of um, maintain the brain happy. <laughs> Um, I think it's possible now. Whether it's ethical, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, but um, but there might be cases where that's what you need. You know, if if you are in an accident, and and you as a person would like to have that life, 
then they maybe you should consider, right? You have the technology, right? But, uh, but again, this is, these are very important questions that we don't know yet what's the right answer, but we need to talk about it. Well, so let's go, let's have this last question be, it comes from someone called Third Row Left, so I think they're sitting right over there. Does the person have to shave their hair for the surface electrodes to work best? Interestingly, they seem to be sitting right behind David, I would, I would <laughs> estimate. That, that, that will help, but it's not necessary. Um, so um, there are different types of sensors. We use one that we uh, put some gel to ensure there is contact between the scalp and the sensor. There are dry sensors that have like, legs that, that can go through the hair and make contact. Uh, this technology is still changing, uh, but um, you don't really need to, to shave your hair, um, although it will be helpful, but, but we don't require that. Um, yes, so. <laughs> Great. All right. Um, we're going to have the raffle now, but let's thank Dr. Jose Contreras Vidal once again. Thank you.